I preached the book of Galatians many times in a lot of countries. And if I've got three days, if I've got three days in one place, I usually preach through the book of Galatians because it's a chapter that, and a, and a book that, that really has the whole message of the gospel. Now I want to say what the gospel is so we'll all be on the same page. What is the gospel? Death. The death and it's the burial and the resurrection of Christ. The gospel is the good news. But all over the world, I'm finding out, there are many people, and I think it's worse in the United States, there are many people that are not preaching the gospel, but they're preaching a potential gospel. Christ died, was buried, and was raised. The Bible tells us who that was for. It was for all men. But some people believe that you have to do something before that it applies to you. Now, you must believe it, and you must receive it. But it's been given. The gift of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ for you has been given. Paul is preaching or teaching in writing this letter to the churches in Galatia. Galatia is a group of churches. It's not just one church, but it's, I believe it's one of the most important books of the Bible because we have, it's a mini Romans. It, it's almost a condensed Romans. It's like the cliff notes of the, Roman, the book of Romans. Here Paul is dealing with the problem that's plaguing churches today, and it's deserting the gospel of grace. I'm afraid that even those that claim to be preaching grace have deserted the gospel of grace. And he's writing this while he was on his third missionary journey. Now, Paul was with these churches during his second missionary journey, but now he's writing back to them. And I'm just going to read verse 1 through, I think, 1 through 5, then we'll talk about it in a minute. Paul, an apostle not sent from men nor the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me, the churches of Galatia, to, uh, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever, forevermore. Amen. I'm going to pick it up there and from there in just a minute, but we're going to see the source of Paul's authority. Paul is not sent by any sending agency. He's not sent by men. Not at all. He's an apostle, sent in the authority of Jesus Christ and God the Father. He was in Christ and he was with Christ. And, and amazingly, this is the same authority that we could have for ourselves. We make the same claim. Now, I'm not opposed to working with any organization, any sending organization. I'm certainly not opposed to that. And I believe that there are certain things that we must believe. And if somebody really, I believe, believes wrong and thinks that it has anything to do with what you do or works or law in any way, I'm, I'm probably not going to associate as far as a sending organization. Will I deal with them? Yes, I will. Because Jesus loves them too. But Paul is saying here that he's not sent by man. He's saying that all the power Jesus had on the earth was available to him through the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Jesus died, and the Father raised him from the dead. And the Father was in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And the Father is every much a part of the gospel <coughs> as Christ the Son is. It was exactly the same idea of God the Father and God the Son concerning the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. God was in it. He's not sent for man or any agency of man. He was not a religious authority. Now, why am I hanging out there talking about that a lot? I'm going to tell you what happened to me. I was in Mexico preaching, and when I got off the airplane, I was had on this shirt that said Grace Walk on it. And this couple from Canada came up to me, and they said, What is your authority here? Excuse me? What is your authority? They wanted to know what my qualifications they were. They asked me, said, what are your qualifications to preach? What are your qualifications to preach? Knowing Christ. Knowing Christ. You're talking about telling folks what Christ has done for you. You're just sharing this message. One of the words for preach is gossip. But they wanted to know what my qualifications were. Kind of tickled me to tell you the truth. I wasn't offended. I said, well... I have a seminary degree. I was in seminary four years past college. And they go, oh, qualified. Well, if that was the 
the case then, some of the greatest preachers that ever lived were not qualified. Because I'm telling you, it's not the pedigree that you achieve with man that qualifies you. It's the fact that you know that Jesus Christ is your life, that it was all him, that it was none of you. And all you're doing is sharing the good news that God has given to you. You're sharing that with other people. Jesus, or Paul said, and concerning Jesus in 2 Corinthians, when he, in chapter 5, when he said that you're going to become a reconciler of men. That means you're going to tell people about the reconciliation of God the Father and Christ the Son toward men. You're going to be an ambassador. That's what you're going to be. The qualification for that is you must know what he has done. And you tell people what he has done. And you believe it. That's the qualification. We see in verse 3 the recipients of the letter. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. Verse, verse uh, 4. But if you go back in, into uh, verse 2, the last part of verse 2, to the churches of Galatia. The churches of Galatia. Let me tell you a little bit more about the churches of Galatia. They were the ones that checked people out. They were the ones that had the best Bible conferences. They were the ones that everybody else looked to. They were the Harvard of the churches in the area. What do I say they were the Harvard? Do you know that Harvard has never been accredited as a university? It has no accreditation. Why? Because it doesn't need one. Harvard accredits other people. They don't need to be accredited. You don't need to be accredited by anybody other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can represent some organization, but ultimately, Christ is your life. He's the one. Paul was dealing with folks. Let me tell you some of the people that were living in this area that had influence here. Peter, we're going to see that later on. James, the Lord's brother, even Barnabas. They were the ones that he was dealing with. The churches of Galatia, where Paul had gone on his second missionary journey. We're talking about Pisidian and Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. Peter, James, the Lord's brother, and, and, and Barnabas, these were all guys that he was dealing with. Paul and Barnabas had already split up and gone their separate ways. Paul and Silas are now together. John, Mark, and Barnabas are together. And we have two missionary groups that are going out, and what started out as a bad thing turned into a good thing. But Paul didn't refer to the people in this church. Now, I want to show you something. This is a big deal. He did not refer to the people in this church. I'm not making anything other than the fact that it's not there. He didn't call them saints. In the other epistles, he starts them off. Even in 1 Corinthians, which was a wicked church, he said, to these saints who are at. And in other epistles, he said, to these saints, to these saints, to these saints. And here, he did not do that. He did not say, to these saints. Where Paul had gone on his second missionary journey, he didn't refer to that. Does that mean they're not saved? I didn't say that. I'm just telling you. That's not how he addressed them. And it's a big deal. But let me tell you what he did say. We'll see it later on. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, he said, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Do you know that if you're mixing law and grace, that you would be in that same list of, Oh, you foolish folks, who has bewitched you? This is a, a message of of uh, Paul's letter, he said, Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. This is the message. It's a simple message. Grace and peace. Let me say this. Grace equals peace equals Jesus. They're all the same. He said, From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see three names. Father, Lord, Jesus, Christ. Now, we see when he referred to Jesus, he called him Lord. In the Hebrew, that word would be Yahweh, I am. And when he said Jesus, that word in the Hebrew is Yeshua. It means Savior. And Christ means Messiah. So look what he's doing. He's got Father right here. And then he's given all the titles of Jesus right there. He is the Lord. He is I am. He is the Savior. And he is the Messiah. He is all of those things. He's adding some heavy credibility right here. Heavy credibility. 
And it shows the ultimate source of Paul's authority. And I'm saying that to say this. You have the same authority that Paul had. You were qualified in Christ to share the message of his grace. There will be the same kind of people that will come against you as came against Paul. Now, Paul had the pedigree. He was trained under the top Pharisees. But Paul says, I am counting that as, you know the word he used when he talked about his training? He said, I'm counting it as dung. I'm counting it as manure. It's worth nothing. My qualification is because I am in the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm also sent by the Father. To do what? To share grace and peace. Now, when, when somebody receives God's grace, which is a gift, and that's what the word grace means, gift, charis, it means gift. When somebody receives God's grace, he will be at peace. But you know what? You can, you can search for peace thinking that you have some part of it as long as you think that your relationship with God has anything to do with you, you will never be at peace. Never. You will never be at peace if you think that in any way, shape, or form that your actions have anything to do with God's feelings towards you. Because if that's the case, then all you can do is fail. If you believe that, then you're going to think that God is displeased with you. But he was pleased with you from before the foundation of the world. We were talking about it before we started. Christ, the Lamb, as if slain before the foundation of the world. That's when the cross went into being. Before time even existed. You were chosen in him, in love, before the foundation of the world. It's all about what he did. Our only part is to believe and receive this gift of himself that he's given us. When one receives grace, he's going to be at peace. When you come out from under his grace and go back under the law, there is no peace. Would you say that most Christians are walking in peace today? I would say most of them are not. Why do we want this condemnation brought back on us? Why would we put condemnation on anybody? Why do we preach as a Christian condemnations to others which leads to lack of peace? I just have one question. Why? And then one statement. This is tragic. It's tragic. And I'm telling you, it does more harm than you can imagine. Law never brings peace. It only brings condemnation. If you're causing someone to examine themselves under the law, you're telling them you are condemned. Because that's all that can happen. We don't try to balance grace and law. You can't balance grace and law. Law does not exist in the life of the believer. It is not for the believer. To try to balance grace and law is like balancing water and poison. Well, you have to have a balance. You see, because the law kills. The letter of the law kills, the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans 7, chapter 7, verse 5, it says that the law entices you to sin. The Bible says that the law brings the fruit of, does anybody know that next word? It's the fruit of death. The law kills. The living water, Jesus, he gives life. He is life. We don't balance those. One sustains life. One kills. Now, we all believe that you're saved by grace through faith. We all believe that. I don't know any true Christians that don't believe that. And I believe they're really saved. But I'm telling you, if we slip gently or run headlong back into law, we're preaching death. We're preaching condemnation. Well, grace and truth aren't balanced either. Some people think that you balance grace and truth. You have to have a balance. You have to be careful with this grace. You can go too far with this grace. There has to be a balance. Friend, grace and truth are the same. You don't have to worry about a balance because they're the same. They're the same. Jesus is our grace. Jesus is the truth. To know grace is to know the truth, and you don't balance them. You only believe and receive them as a gift that has already been given. Now, some people, and I call this part of their balancing act, they believe, yes, 
There's a potential gift here. There's a gift offered, but the gift is not yours until you receive it. Friend, the gift is given when it's given, and it's yours when it's given. Now, what you do with it, it's your business, but it's been given. It's been given at the cross. We were having a conversation, a friend of mine that I met the other day, we were having a conversation about a pardon for somebody that was on death row. The governor had signed a pardon. He signed it, put his name on it, and put who the pardon was for. He put the other man's name on it. The pardon was only for that man, and it was given by the governor, and it was taken to the man, and the man said, nope, I don't want it. I won't receive it, and he died. Now, that's just an illustration. It's not Bible. And then we talked about, and I said, well, when did the pardon become his? He said, when he received it. I said, oh, no. That pardon became fully his when the governor signed it, put his name, and when he put the other man's name on there. I'm telling you, the pardon of the cross, and it's much more than that. It was yours when it was given, and it was given at the cross, and the cross is eternal, and it's yours whether you receive it or not. But it only benefits you if you receive it. It only benefits you if you receive it and believe that it's yours. And that's what Christ has already done. He's already given it. But you must believe. Gave himself, it says in verse 4, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Boy, I like that. Gave himself because of our sins that he might rescue us from this present evil age. We've been rescued. Gave himself on behalf of or because of. We were guilty. He was innocent. We receive and believe his grace. All him, none of me, saved by grace. And now we live and walk the same way we were saved by grace. But it's all him. No other way to live. Rescued from this present evil age. Now what is the evil age? In the context of what we're talking about that, I want to talking about here, the evil age is not lawlessness like murderers and thieves. Do we live in an age like that? Yes, we do. But that's not what Paul's talking about right here. What ta Paul's talking about in context of this whole chapter, this present evil age, he's talking about they have been rescued from dead religion. That's what we're talking about right here. That's what you've been rescued from. If in any way, any way we tell people that it has anything to do with them and what they do, then we're placing them back under religion. And we're placing them back under this evil age. And the Bible says they've been rescued from that. In the last part of this chapter, in this verse, it says, according to the will of our God and Father. God the Father is in full agreement with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people have the idea that, that God the Father is a God of wrath and He'll put the hammer down on you if you don't do right. And God, Jesus, God the Son, He loves you. But it says right here that, that He was in full agreement, God the Father, the will of our God and Father. He was in full agreement with the grace. The Trinity was all about grace. It still is. And the law did not enter in at all. In other words, it was his idea, God the Father, from eternity past to show grace. In verse 5, to whom uh, be the glory forever. Amen. Now, in, the, in this verse, be is not in the original language. It would say, to whom the glory forever, forevermore. Amen. Glory. God the Father receives glory due him. His grace, now listen to this, not only leads to His glory, but even better, His grace flows out of His glory. Do you know when He gives grace to you, you know what He's done? He's given you Himself. Do you know that He's literally put His glory in you? And I've said this to you before and I've said it to others. I used to say that God won't share His glory with anyone, but that's absolutely not right. He did share His glory with you. You are the glory of the Father. That's just unbelievable. We just had our seventh grandchild, day before yesterday. Man, the Bible talks about that. It said it's the glory to the men with gray hair. Now, my hair is, I get them some gray hair. But even though I don't have a lot of gray hair yet, I'm telling you, that's still the glory of the grandfather. God the Father looks at you much more than I look at my grandchildren. He loves you unconditionally. In verse 6, we see the amazement of Paul's letter. Look at this. He says, I am amazed. Look what he says. 
I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. I'm amazed, I'm amazed that you're deserting this, this grace. Deserting the gospel of grace in Christ. Paul can't believe it so quickly. We don't know the time span here, but Paul was bewildered that they would desert the gospel of grace at all. Now we're supposed to grow in his grace, not grow away from his grace. When you grow in grace, what does that mean? To most folks that I've come in contact with, they understand this much about grace and they stop right there. And it goes as far as they understand. And if they don't understand past that, it doesn't exist. That's what they think. But in truth, when you grow in grace, that means that God is revealing even more of what he's already done for you and in you. As we begin to see ourselves the way he sees us, his grace looks bigger and bigger and bigger. I believe that's why we're going to need eternity for God to reveal just what a big deal this grace was. And for me to think, the audacity of me to think that grace could not exist beyond what I know, how silly is that? And for other people, it's just as silly. We're supposed to grow in this grace. He said that they were embracing a different gospel. Well, if it's a different gospel, what kind of gospel must it be? It must be a false gospel. A false gospel. Anything that goes away. What is the gospel? The good news? Paul said it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and all that entails. If we go away from that, we are embracing a false gospel. And I see this happening all over the world. I see Christians becoming angry when I believe true grace is preached. Angry. Mad. In verse 7, he talks about a distortion of the gospel. Look at this. Which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. The gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. They're distorting the gospel. It's not a different gospel. They believe that salvation is by grace through faith. Same gospel. But now they're preaching a different gospel for living. They're preaching a mixing of grace and law. And Paul said it was disturbing. And folks, it should disturb us today that that's being preached. You're not saved one way and live another way. Is there liberty in grace? Yes, freedom. Freedom for what? Freedom to walk in who you are. Is there freedom to sin? You don't have to have freedom to sin. You're pretty good at that, aren't you? Some people say, well, if you just preach that, people are just going to go on sinning. I say, excuse me? You don't have any issue with sin there? It's a non-issue with you? Well, no, I still struggle with some areas. Really? Only a few? Huh. Well, the Bible says that by grace through faith, that's how we live. Our victory is in Christ and in no other way. By you trying not to sin, that's all you're going to do is sin. But as you say, Christ, I can't deal with this. You do it through me, and he will. But I'm going to tell you something. Sin in no way is who you are. That's flesh. It's not who you are. When you understand your true identity, that's when you're going to see victory, and only then. He says, if any man preaches a different gospel. Now, this is, this is, a, this is a harsh thing, but it's what he says. Then he's to be accursed. Look at verse 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed, an angel. And some were. In verse 9, As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. Well, here it is. If an angel from heaven should preach a different gospel, he's cursed. And this is the strongest thing Paul could say. And this curse is from God. Now, some people say, I don't believe in that. Well, I'm just reading you what the Bible says. Paul is saying it is a curse to preach a different gospel. Now, what is the gospel? Again, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. When did that take place? From before the foundation of the world. Now, it was fleshed out in time about 2,000 years ago, the cross. That is to say that your own efforts are needed 
for the living of a godly life. If you're preaching that, then you're preaching what has caused people to be cursed. Your own efforts are not what brings joy to the Father. Your own efforts are not what brings victory to you. It makes Christ's death, burial, and resurrection insignificant. In verse 9, if any man preaches a different gospel, he is to be accursed. This should get our attention. Am I saying that they're lost again? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. In verse 10, Paul is not seeking the favor of men. Look in verse 10. For I am now seek for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? He said, Am I seeking the favor of men? The answer would be no. Am I seeking the favor of God? Let me tell you this. He has the favor of God. He already has it. Or am I striving to please men? What would be the answer to that? No. If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul's not seeking the favor of men at all. If we were, he would not deliver this message. He would not deliver this message. It was not popular then. And it's not how the religious folks like to hear things. It's not what they do. But to the broken and to the desperate, it is living water that satisfies and brings life. The problem that I see with people when I'm talking to them, they're not broken enough. They're not desperate enough. But here's the good news. God loves them so much. He will bring them to the end of themselves. That's why this message of the grace of our Lord, the radical grace of Jesus, is very difficult to be heard and understood in our country, in the USA. Now I can go to Pakistan, and religious and non-religious both hear it, and they say, this is truth. I can go other places where people are hungry and desperate, if I'm speaking to folks that are at a rehab place, for lack of a better word, or prison, they're ready to hear this message because they know there's nothing in themselves. But when I tell them and I look them in the eye and I say, not based on what you have done or will ever do, Jesus loves you. Now we tell people Jesus loves you and we sing the song Jesus loves you, but we don't believe it. Because you see, we don't believe that Jesus loves somebody until they believe him. But I'm telling you, he loved you first. That's in the Bible. We need to believe what we sing. We need to believe what we say. He's not trying to get the favor of God either because he has the favor of God. He's preaching the gospel of complete grace because he has the favor of God. Well, I got some good news for you too. You have the favor of God. It is finished. The other week I preached on Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness. It's aorist imperative. Completed action. Can't be done again. Finished. And then he tops it off by saying, It is finished. Finished. Nothing else to do. Folks, there's nothing else to do for you or for anyone else. It's finished. Live in the favor that you have. Know it. Tell others of his undeserved favor toward them. It's called grace. God, through the cross, not only has restored, but is restoring man. He finished everything concerning all men on the cross. The issue is all men don't believe it. They must believe it, but I'm telling you the last Adam has dealt with the iniquity and the sin and the transgression of the first Adam. And the first Adam and the, and the curse that came on man because of the first Adam was dealt with by the death of the last Adam. This does not mean that people don't need to be saved. They do. This does not mean that people don't need to believe. They do. But this does mean at the cross, it was finished. There's a name for this. It's called grace. And I got a feeling it's bigger than this. It's even bigger than we know. And if we live a few more years, maybe God's going to reveal some more to us about it. And it's going to seem shocking, the things that he's going to show us about his unconditional favor toward you and toward me and toward men based on what he did, not on what we do. And it's going to seem too much. And we're going to think they don't deserve it. And all of that would be right. They don't deserve it. But for whatever reason, God chose to do it 
this way. Just believe it. It is finished.